It's time for us to begin class, and we're very grateful for your presence this morning. And this is our custom. Let us go to our Heavenly Father in prayer before we begin the study of the Bible. Our Holy Father, grateful are we that thou spare our lives. For thou art the giver of life, and we pray that we will respect that and honor thee for giving us this life. Gracious Father, we are thankful to be together this morning in freedom to study thy word. May our intent and purposes be to know thy will for our lives, that we might consider these things and examine our lives in the light of them, that we might serve thee faithfully. We're thankful for all material blessings, for the rain we've received from thy hand, for our food and clothing and shelter. May we be thankful for the freedoms we enjoy in this nation, and may we use them as thy people to spread and defend the gospel. Gracious Father, we recognize our shortcomings and weaknesses and pray that Thou would strengthen us, that Thou would help us be walking closer to Thee in obedience to Thy will. Be with us through the study of Thy Word in this class period and the hour to follow to worship Thee in spirit and in truth, that day by day we will yield our bodies living sacrifices unto Thee, which is our reasonable service. Holy Father, may we pray without ceasing and in all things with prayer and supplication and thanksgiving make our request be made known to thee defeat us in evil raise us up in good help us to be ever saying not our will but thine be done and laboring accordingly give us contrite hearts hearts easily picked by the truth that we might love the truth as we are to love thee with all that we are and have to love our neighbors ourselves to love the brethren Help us to know that thy love always leads us to obey thy will. And may we so cultivate that kind of love that we can help each other walk in the straight and narrow way of truth. Have mercy upon us as we are merciful and forgiving toward others. And forgive us of our sins, for we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. I always feel like on <clears throat> Sunday morning, trying to get myself all up and going, like a professor I had when I was working on my master's degree. <laughs> we had a class that met from about 7 o'clock, 10 o'clock each night. They had it set up that way because there were people in there who were teachers, and they had to drive good ways to get to that class, so they set it up that way. He would start off nearly every week saying, well, now I've got to get my dog and pony show together to get you awake and keep you awake so I can get over what I want to, and he'd do it nearly every week. Well, I don't want to put on a dog and pony show primarily because I, I don't consider myself a dog or a pony. Now, what you consider me to be might be something else, but I do uh, hope that I can be mentally capable and stirred up enough physically to, to do what I want to do. Now, remember, we're in a class that's, that's, that's described as searching the Scriptures. There has to be a reason for searching the Scriptures. Let's always remember that God speaks to us through his will, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. If that is the case, then the Bible is given to you and to me so we can understand the way of righteousness. Now, we might find a lot of things in the Bible as the way of righteousness, the way of truth is set out that may not directly connect to that because the Bible was given in history. History defined as past, time, and space. So when God delivered the Bible to us, he did it in past, time, and space as he unfolded down through the centuries the great and magnificent scheme of redemption, how he would save man. Thus he worked with man as man and not himself. Sometimes we may not think that much about it, but there's a reason that God didn't, the moment Adam and Eve sinned, just say, here's the Bible. <laughs> there had to be a development of man and growth of man. So there's an important thing to understand about us from the Bible, that is about mankind. And we need to know that also. But that's not the purpose now. We're not trying to prove the existence of God, the deity of Christ, or the plenary verbal inspiration of the Scriptures. That is, that in the original language, all the words were inspired of the Holy Spirit, and every word was inspired of the Holy Spirit. We're not trying to prove that now. Those are classes really in and of themselves. So we're assuming that people believe that this is the Bible, that it is God's Word, that it directs us on earth how to get to heaven. 
Now, if there are questions that arise in anybody's mind regarding the things I just mentioned, uh, which I said we're not trying to necessarily prove right now, the deity of Christ, the existence of God, or the inspiration of the scriptures, then feel free to jot those down and we can deal with them particularly. In fact, on any question that may come to mind that we're not dealing with in this uh, study of rightly dividing the word of God or searching the scriptures, then feel free to jot those down and we'll try to take care of them as we can. Now, to backtrack for a moment, Gary, could you put up the one on the different ages, please? Let's remember there are 66 books making up the one volume called the Bible, and there are 39 making the Old Testament, and 27 making up the New Testament. That once we begin to break down, no, sir, the one that has patriarchal age on it. Uh, when we break down then the Bible as to coming down through the ages, then we'll see we have the patriarchal age. What does that mean? Well, it means God dealt with man through the heads of families, the patriarch, the father, and sometimes it's called the father rule, period. You'll notice in your book on page three at the top of the page, it'll say patriarchal age, Genesis 1, 1 through Exodus 20. Now, why is it that way? Well, the Bible, remember, is being revealed down through the ages, and this is the first great age or dispensation of time in which God dealt with man. It lasted roughly uh, 2,500 years. Now this is having to do with the development, that is the Bible, the development of the Messianic promise, the Messianic family, and out of it comes the Messianic nation. So it's not interested in going off out here about all the world, how it developed. Therefore, you don't f find Gentiles non Israelites, non-Jews, spoken of that much. It concentrates on the Jews and gets to, us, gets to the Jews rather quickly. When you get past the flood, immediately you have Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the sons of Noah. And all people on the earth come from them. And you'll notice when you're reading Genesis that Ham and Japheth and their descendants are dropped rather quickly. But then inspiration through Moses, for he wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. You'll notice that he zeroes in on which one of the sons? Shem. Thus we speak of the Jews and others of that area as Semites. Now if you go back to the beginning, uh, Cain killed Abel. He killed Abel because Abel was faithful to God, that's all. And uh, so another was born to take his place, and that was Seth. Through Seth comes then the people who serve God all the way down to the time of Noah, but even then that had been corrupted. And thus Noah and his family were the only ones that found grace in God's sight, Genesis 6 and verse 8. And thus God, that is favors, thus God gave him the directions to be saved from the flood. Verse 22 says, Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Thus you see grace through an obedient faith saved Noah. We'll say something more about that maybe later. <coughs> Thus we have the development of the Messianic family. We know through Abraham, you get the call of Abraham in Genesis 12, through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and from his sons developed the whole nation of Israel. They developed over 400 years down in Egypt. For a while they were free, but then they became slaves and God raised up Moses to deliver them. And they eventually, of course, get to Canaan. Under Joshua, they possess the land God had promised originally to Abraham. And there they are. But now we are in the patriarchal age, all the way down to the giving of the law of Moses to the Jews in Exodus chapter uh, 20. I haven't mentioned this yet, but if you go back and read a lot of old time preaching, then you'll see that the old time preachers are trying to show this development, how greater light was being gradually set upon how God would save man through Christ. They would talk about the, patriarch, the patriarchal age as the moonlight period. The moonlight period. Then they would, uh, or the starlight period, excuse me. And then they would talk about the law of Moses as the starlight period, but then the Christian age or dispensation as the sunlight period. No play on words there. 
So the idea is, is that gradually more knowledge came as to how God would save man. And thus in Galatians 4, 4, Paul writes, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. There's a lot you can get out of that short statement in the fullness of time because it means God's in control. And providentially, God being who God is, he knows the end from the beginning. He made time. He'll end time. He can work within time. He's not limited by time. A day is with the Lord is a thousand years, Peter wrote. A thousand years is a day. Thus, we need to not view God as limited as we are limited. But once he made this world as he made it, all of its physical laws and so forth, and then made us to live in it, we're regulated by those physical laws. Then he has to work it with us as he created us. be rather ridiculous for God to create us in one way and then work with us in another way. So when it comes to learning, we do what we're doing now. We are made to gather information process that information in reasoning with it and we have to learn something about reasoning correct prove all things hold fast that which is good for Thessalonians 5 21 so we do that that's how you put together this whole approach to rightly dividing or handling and write the word of truth 2 Timothy 2 15 now I suggest that while you probably won't memorize all of these Adam Cain Abel Seth Enos and so on that you become familiar with those names because those are important names in this starlight period of the patriarchal age in which God is dealing with man. So there's some great lessons to be learned. You'll notice on point C on page three, great lessons to be learned from this 2,500 year period. We've already mentioned that creation is Genesis, means origin or beginning. And thus you would tend to expect that the beginning of everything in a book where God communicates to man about himself and he's headed mainly to spiritual forgiveness of sins, that he would tell about the creation. I, I, we could spend about, I don't know how long, the first four chapters of Genesis just simply seeing all the things that are taught there that bear upon us today. I, I'll mention this in passing, though we'll come back to it. Uh, just simply the beginning of the creation of man and woman. Think how confused people are today because they reject God and the Bible concerning man's creation. All they've got to do is see God made humanity in two classes, male and female. You can't transition from one to the other. And it doesn't take very long to see how he had marriage arranged, one man to one woman, until death threw them part. That's the general rule. That's how he did it. So... You look at around our nation today. It's just accepted what's said in the Bible regarding male and female and marriage as God said it. Look at what it's off. And that's just barely scratching the surface, if it even scratches the surface. Moreover, you see what we spent some time on last week and a week before even concerning deity. It's hard to understand. God and none of us as a human being can really grasp Deity. Think of this when you think of capital G O D, one God. What you need to have in your mind is there is one divine essence. It doesn't have a beginning, it doesn't have an end. It inhabits eternity. And I'm deliberately using it here, not because it isn't it, simply to single it out. The Bible refers to the one entity, the one divine essence, as He. I was amazed a little bit some time back. I was doing some studying. I forget the name of this fellow. I should remember it, but he was an authority. He's been dead for Metzger, that's his name. As you think about the development of the Greek language, you'll know Metzger learned for years at Harvard and did some great work. Liberalism was that, uh, that uh, popular. <laughs> He said they were in a, I guess you'd say, a conclave of some sort, a gathering when they were talking about translation. And there was one very, I don't know what he called it, this liberal person. By liberal, I always mean those who teach doctrines which loose men from what God and His Word binds upon them. And she suggested that they refer to God as she. 
And he was talking about the caliber man that Metzger was, Metzger was, he'd been dead for years now, but said that he simply spoke very quietly and said, if you're willing to call the devil a she, you will call God she. Well, the little mind of a woman does not like that. So he said there was nothing else said about calling God she. <laughs> so there's various ways to approach things. God revealed himself as he. Now, why would I want to quibble with that if I believe all the Bible says about God? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But when you see him introduced in John 1, 1 and 2, it's uh, the Word was with God and the Word was God. And the same was in the beginning. Now we're back to Genesis with God. When was the beginning? I can answer that very plain to you. In the beginning. Now, that's all you can say about that. In the beginning. So we take the Bible as it's fitted for us who are set into this world of time, space, and material things and physical laws. And God has delivered us then these things about Himself. We can understand God primarily from this standpoint as it relates to our salvation and His part in it. Now, how we may or may not understand God in eternity, when this whole system is passed, we're no longer involved in it, no possibility of sin, there's no devil, there's nothing else. How we will understand deity when we're in glorified, resurrected bodies as Christ now possesses. Remember, that we do not shall be like, but we shall be like Him. Well, we can't become God, so it must be in the glorified body that we will have even as he presently possesses so how will we understand him then the only thing i can say to you is prepare yourself now so you can get there and figure it out then if such is possible there are some things we just don't know and thus deuteronomy 29 and verse 29 comes to mind anybody want to tell me what moses communicates there the secret things belong to god Things that are revealed unto us and our children forever. Isn't it anything that it's something about human nature that says, if it's secret, I've got to spend my time trying to find it out when we'll take the things revealed to us and be ignorant as a stump about them? That ought to tell us something about ourselves. First of all, we can be our worst enemy. So we ought to be attentive to the things revealed, the scriptures. For all scriptures given me inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. So deity is the one divine essence. He's made up. Notice I use limited words, made up, because God's not made up anything, but for sake of our understanding, then we accommodate our minds, and he is in three persons. Usually use the triangle, which I've done before, to say there's one single solitary triangle. But in order to be that one single solitary essence, there has to be what? Three sides. And that's the best way I can, though that does not by any means begin to describe deity. But that's the way it is. There is the first, second, third person of the Godhead. And, of course, that second person of the Godhead, being the executor of the Father's will, be the one to carry out the salvation process in becoming a man on this earth. And so in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The same as in the beginning God, with God. Verse 14, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we know the process whereby He was made flesh. The Holy Spirit came upon the Virgin Mary and she conceived without a man being involved. So God is the Father. So it's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There's the first person, second person, third person of the Godhead. That's important to understand. I've given you some scriptures, or at least the scriptures are here, that show you that in the beginning of things, uh, while we say God created the heavens and the earth, that's the inspiration of the Holy Spirit said, we must realize all three persons of the Godhead had a part in it. And you'll remember that in John 1, he says, uh, of the Word, he says, without him was not anything made that was made. So the Father, as we want to refer to him nowadays, uh, 
through the Son did the creating. The first person through the executive, the second person did the creating of the world. Now, you'll notice also that the Holy Spirit uh, brooded over the waters. So you see, really, there is something said of all three persons in the beginning of the heavens and the earth. Now, I think I pointed out last time too, and I'll just go back over it again. Beginning gives us time. God gives us force. Created gives us action. And the heavens give us space. And the earth gives us mass. Is this thing fading in and out? Okay. I'm already cutting out, so if this goes out, you just bear with me. So um, that's who's involved, and yet all three persons are. We mentioned last week um, where God said concerning man, let us make man in our image. Verse 26, after our likeness. Well, it's rather obvious that uh, he did not make man physically in his image, for as Jesus would say in John 4, God is spirit. Well, the Spirit doesn't have flesh and bones. God is eternal Spirit. He does not have a beginning or ending. So, the image is the moral likeness. What makes you say when a little child is abused, raped, or murdered? Thank you. What makes you say, that ought not to have happened? What makes you say that? Where does the sense of oughtness come from? Made in God's image? From the Creator. That's the part that's stamped on your spirit, which the Hebrews writer says, God is the Father of our spirits. Yeah, it would be, which also ties us back into, for lack of a better way to put it anyway, so it also ties us back into the, the false idea of Calvinism. Remember, Calvinism, one of its tenets is that uh, all people born in this world after Adam's sin actually inherit the original sin of Adam. How is that possible? Well, think for a moment. Adam sinned, didn't he? Who was his father? So how did he come to sin? You're not going to attribute by implication that God's capable of sin. Ma'am? Well, yes, but it's true. But I'm talking about as far as, you may not be that familiar with this doctrine yet, but in time in your study you may be. But uh, if you're going to say that all sins inherited, then where did Adam get his sense of being able to even break God's law? Where it doesn't make sense if you apply it to the doctrine of Calvinism concerning original sin as to how Adam even came to sin. Was God uh, messed up and Adam inherited? Yes, sir. He's as much man as a man is. That's right. So logically, these things begin to fall apart. And I suggest to you when you study these things, first of all, knowing the truth of what the Bible says, but then you begin to apply these doctrines to what you know the Bible says, and they blow up. It's just a matter of thinking it through and learning how to think it through. So when God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, how are you like God? Has Spirit, yes, true, but how is that spirit? What stamp does it have upon it? It has God's stamp upon it. And so it is that uh, we are able then to be communicated with concerning, because we have a will too, you know, we can either understand and obey the truth or understand and reject the truth. God placed us in a, in a world that's like that. And the Bible itself actually implies that. The Bible's given to instruct us in righteousness. How many Bibles do you think in the United States right now? 
no way to measure it. About as many guns. Uh, I venture to say that even still, far more, far more bottles than guns. And I, and when you now if you were to carry that even further, they probably know how to use those guns about as well as most of them know how to use the Bible, which would end up somebody shooting in their foot or worse. But the point is, this Bible implies that man needs instruction. If it doesn't imply that, why did God give it to us? Let me ask you this. Why didn't God just simply create us not to sin? That's exactly right. God would not love us if he made it impossible for us to choose one way or the other. Now, upon making us free moral agents and able to choose, which we run into right in the beginning in, in Genesis, in Adam and Eve, then, of course, that allows for man to choose against God and sin. How do you think evil got in this world? Through God? Or through man? man? Through men. It's in Genesis. The devil appeals to man through the lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. God gave one command as far as to test their confidence and trust in him and his word. What was that command? It's a prohibition. Don't eat of the tree in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. How did the devil... Get Eve to believe a lie and obey a lie and bring sin to the world. How do you do it? Yeah, the old preacher used to preach the knot in the devil's tail. And that's exactly right. Thou shalt not surely die. God said, Thou shalt surely die. Isn't that simple? Now, if you know God and all that God is said, if you eat that, you're going to die, what was the big problem? Why don't you just stay with that? You're here because God created you out of the rib of Adam. He's here because God created him from the dust of the ground. Everything you've got is because of God, and yet the devil comes along and is able to sell a bill of goods, false goods, to Eve by trying to say, God's holding things back from you. He knows if you protect this, you'll be so on and so on and so forth. You can read it right here. And so man was deceived. Remember this. Sin comes into your life and my life. When we're deceived, we believe the lies if it were the truth. And when we obey that lie, thus we sin. To be acceptable to God, we believe the truth. We obey that truth, and we're acceptable to God. So God didn't just... Drop the whole way of salvation on man once man sinned, Adam and Eve sinned. But he gradually took time for man to develop. Have you ever ask yourself the question, what, what was the state, not speaking spiritually, but just the, the way that Adam and Eve were put together physically? What did they look like? You know what you'll do most of the time? You'll think they look like you. <laughs> But how do we know what they look like physically? We don't. How do we know how much they knew in so many ways? Well, evidently they didn't, and I'll tell you why I know. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years passed as man grew and developed socially and a lot of other ways before it was the right time for Christ to come into the world. There was a development of men. Now, if you read secular history, even the Bible, which is, of course, inspired history, where it's dealing with unfolding the scheme of redemption throughout history, you'll see that man did a lot of changing. And in the patriarchal age, can anybody, let's ask it this way, can anybody give me any persons that live that were important outside what the Bible says, which deals primarily with forgiveness of sins, remember that, and how God would do it, that lived back to the time of what we would call the patriarchal or father rule period. Anybody? Though, how many people here have been to college? Oh, 
Okay, I see a few. How many of you had an introduction to world history? How many of you remember it when you woke up to listen now and then? <laughs> if I say the code of, will that ring a bell to anybody? The code of. I knew you could get it. The code of Hammurabi. The what? <laughs> That's what most people say, the code. C O D E code of Hammurabi. Hammurabi was a king. He lived back in the time of Abraham. What's significant about the code of Hammurabi? It's the first uh, codification means written down. The first codification of law that we know of in secular history. And it's interesting, it all comes from the same part of the world where Abraham lived. So what I'm saying by that is, this had nothing to do with the revelation of God's will to man directly as to what he ought to do and ought not do in the patriarchal age to be pleasing to God. But it shows the development of man. He developed into a point of realizing there was a need of a law to govern everything. Give me the definition of a law or of law. Who said that? Rule of action. That's exactly right. A rule of action. A rule of action. Well, what does that mean? A rule of action. Well, let's think for a moment. We talk about in the United States, we are a people of law, and not men. That's good. That's the way it ought to be anyway. Some of those who talk about it the most sometimes turn out to be against it the worst. <laughs> A rule of law. Why did our founding fathers set up a constitution? Well, before that, an Articles of Confederation, it wasn't what they wanted, so they got rid of that and made the constitution. Why did they do that? <laughs> they knew there had to be a standard. And from it would come all laws in the United States. So they have to set up a government. It works that way. What branch of the government deals in making laws? Legislature. Now, why is there a judiciary branch in the federal government? To uh, analyze. In the light of what? In, in the light of the, what's the law written well, down. Well, the well, 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 back up. Why is that constitution there? So the U.S. Supreme Court, if it operates like it ought to, is to see that every law is what? Constitutional. It's constitutional. And when it says it's unconstitutional, what do you mean? It violates, <laughs> it violates the Constitution. So then you've got to figure out how do you violate the Constitution. But the point is it's in man to do that. And early on, the Code of Hammurabi said we've got to have some sort of standard to go by. It can't be at the whim of people. Can't be at all. What where they got that idea of the rule of law? Over millions and millions of years of chance evolution coming from dead rocks and dirt and finally it turned into a human being, duh, so it just happened. Already God infused it in us. At the very beginning, he gave one law that tried our faith, Adam and Eve's faith, trust, confidence in God and his word. Man is created to abide by some sort of rule of action. Now, they had a rule of action. Don't eat of that tree. That was the rule of action. Don't act <laughs> when it comes to partaking of that fruit. They didn't do it. So, sin into the world through the avenue of them being deceived, at least she was deceived, Paul tells us. Adam just took what was set down at the supper table, and Abe didn't even pay attention. He went in with his eyes open. There's nothing said about Adam being deceived. I think a lot of time my brethren miss that, but nothing is said about Adam being deceived. In fact, Paul makes a play on uh, reasoning in woman's situation where he says, woman was deceived in the transgression. But Adam sinned. How did he do it? As I said, <laughs> she gave the fruit to him and he did eat. Paid attention. 
Now, men, that may say you ought to pay attention to what your wife says before you eat, before you take a bite of it. <laughs> but the point is, he should have been vigilant. He should have been mindful. He abdicated his responsibility as the head of the human race when he did that. He should have been minding his business and minding what God put him here for. Now, back to what we're talking about here as far as the rule of law. One of the things you're going to need to do for yourself, and the church needs it as bad as anybody else in this world, is to show that law is absolutely necessary. Some people say, well, where there's favor of God, there's no law. Where there's grace, there's no law. Well, I don't know where they come up with that. They certainly didn't come up with it from what the Bible says. I give you one verse you hear me quote all the time. James 1, verse 25. James, writing by the Holy Spirit, and in writing that, writing part of the New Testament of Christ, said, whoso, what? Whoso continueth therein, what? The perfect law of liberty. Law of liberty? Well, then how are we saved by grace if we must continue in the law of liberty? Liberty meaning set apart and loose from the law of Moses, which does not save any man. By the deeds of the law, Paul said, no flesh can be justified. My point is, when you study the whole unfolding of how God would save man from sin through Christ and by the gospel, which is his power to save us, Romans 1.16, you've got to understand the nature of law, that it is important. And law does not rule out God's favor. It didn't in the situation with Noah. You got both of them mentioned. Verse 8 of Genesis 6, God, or rather Noah, found favor, that's grace, in God's sight. Yet verse 22 of that same chapter says, Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Absolutely. The, the, all of those directions that God gave to Noah was a product of God's favor, God's grace. Thus, the perfect law of liberty, which is the New Testament system, is a product of what? God's grace. So you need to start establishing these things in your mind on these fundamental matters way back over in Genesis. Way back over in Genesis. So the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are there. But at this point, we would simply say they're the first, second, and third person of the Godhead. And they were all active in creation. Uh, we've already mentioned that part. And I give you scriptures here, and won't take the time to go into all those. The scriptures are here under point A of point 1 of C that cites the fact of where all three persons of the Godhead were active in the creation. Now, I want you to keep that in mind. That's the material, physical creation. There's something else going to be created thousands of years later. And God is headed for that. It's the unfold of the scheme of how he would save man from sin. What is established on the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ in Jerusalem? The church. Now, I want you to keep in mind what you've already learned in Genesis in the physical creation. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we commonly today refer to them, were active. What about the establishment of the spiritual kingdom, the church, the body of Christ. Same thing. Every one of them are active. So it's important to put that and file it away right now in your mind where we are in the patriarchal age because that's going to come up later on. So in trying to understand God, he points out here the Father, Son, Holy Spirit are in mind and judgment, purpose and aim. Well, that's true, but that's because they're all of the same essence. Now you say, what do you mean by essence? Whatever there is that is God. I can't go any further than that. Um, can you explain the spirit that dwells in you that God fathered and put in you at conception? Can you explain what the essence of it is? I can't. I know that once uh, we're created, once we're conceived, and God puts the spirit within us, that is, I mean, our spirits, our human spirits, will always be, will always exist. 
And thus we're in this time period, it doesn't hurt to emphasize this as much as we can. In this time, while timing while we're in time and space, then we're expected to be showing God we love him or we don't. We have faith in him and his system of salvation, or we don't. And that we're going to use our lives to study and learn his will that we might do as he pleases on this earth. We would do well to start early on. This has to do with child rearing also. To emphasize to our children, you're not here to please yourself. Yet the world is telling you all around, you are here to please yourself. And so uh, you hear the song like I did it my way. If you try to go to heaven your way, you won't get there. And yet that's the disposition of mind that's on a lot of people. Any questions, comments thus far? Hey, yes, ma'am. Oh yes, Holy Spirit's God. The human Spirit's you. It's your person. It's your center of personality that presently dwells in this fleshly body. That when you die, James says, the body apart from the spirit is dead, meaning separated. And the Old Testament writer said, the spirit returns to God who gave it. That is, it goes into eternity, but it doesn't cease to exist. Death is not ceasing to exist. Death is not going unconscious. So when do you get the Holy Spirit? Well, that's another story as far as getting the Holy Spirit. That assumes you get the Holy Spirit because I don't know what you mean by get the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so <I'm, laughs> that's what you call honesty. So, <laughs> and I think if a whole lot of folks would say just what you said to be honest, they would have to say the same thing. I don't either. So... <laughs> But the main thing we're trying to emphasize here is that God, via the Holy Spirit, gave us the Scriptures. That is, through the Holy Spirit, God gave us the Scriptures. In Ephesians 6, 17, in talking about the spiritual armor that Christians are to put on that we might be able to be faithful, he speaks of the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Holy Spirit works through an instrument. If you were to have surgery, would you say, Dr. So-and-so did my surgery? Is that a common way of referring to it? What did you mean by that is he actually took his finger and made an incision? No, he used instruments. But through his knowledge and, and ability, those instruments were put to use and accomplished what he wanted. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, uses the instruments too, the sword of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God. <clears throat> and in Hebrews 4.12, you see how powerful that Word is. Now, the Word of God is quick and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit, and is a discerner of the thought and the intents of the heart. Then Paul said, preach the Word. So we want to emphasize this work of the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. He reaches man through the sword of the Spirit, His instrument, the Word of God. It's not some sort of better felt than told or like Halloween, things that go boobity boogie in the night and all that. It's not so mysterious anything. It's simply God appealing to rational, intellectual man through evidence, through reading by the Word. That's why we're studying like we're studying. Because how did all the Bible get here? All Scripture is given by what? By inspiration, theophanoustos, compound Greek word, meaning that it's pictured as breathed out from the depths of deity. And the Holy Spirit's the revealer now. We can go into more of that concerning, uh, such as in 1 Corinthians 2, where Paul says the Holy Spirit's the logical one to reveal the mind of God. Why? Because He is God. So it takes God to reveal God. And He says this, that's, you understand that at least is the way Paul's reasoning because you are the only one that can really reveal what's on your mind. And so God's the only one that can reveal what's on his mind. And what's on his mind is the will, of man, will for man to be saved. That is how he would save man. And thus we must study the Bible. That's where we are right now answering these questions. So we want to think of the Holy Spirit at this point from the standpoint of the revealer of the mind of God pertaining to 
man's forgiveness of sins, which he does through a rule of law, the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25, which involves words. Now, as we close out the class, some of you will remember this. Tell me what a word is, W-O-R-D. Tell me what a word is. A vehicle of thought. Why did I understand what he said then when he said vehicle of thought? Words have meanings. Words have meanings. Thus we're to preach the word, the gospel, the faith, because that's the way we learn God's mind. So we talk about revelation. Revelation accommodates you and me as God created us to come to the understanding of anything. So words are vehicles of thought. That's the way thought travels. And if you want to know what's on my mind and I want to know what's on your mind, there has to be a way those ideas travel. And they travel through uh, words. Now, when you come back over to the patriarchal age, I want you to keep this in mind, whether it's the patriarchal age, Moses, Mosaical age, or the Christian age. God communicates with man through words. God communicates with man through words. He does not force a man, bring a free moral agent as he created him, to submit to those words. Thus you have things like, choose you this day whom you will serve. You're given the choice. In this life, you're on probation. Will you serve God? Will you not? Choose you, as Joshua said, choose you this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will, notice, will, will serve Jehovah. So we're in this world trying to understand the Bible, trying to rightly divide the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15, and studying the scriptures to know the mind of God relative primarily to your salvation and my salvation. If you study this Bible and don't learn what to do to be saved, what good has it done you? It hasn't done any good. That's the reason you can have Bibles all over the place. And they're not doing a lot of people much good because people don't know how to study it. You talk to the average denominational person, they'll do well to recognize the significance of being an Old Testament and a New Testament. Just try and see. And you'll see that most people who claim to believe in God and Christ and the Bible don't really understand the division that exists in the Bible to divisions of Old and New Testament. And what we've said thus far, which is still rather early on, um, most people don't understand it. And we could go to, I'm having to skip a lot of things I'd like to spend time on. And you may say, well, it doesn't sound like you're skipping them, but I am. <laughs> that I'd like to give time on. And we will maybe in some later time. One of the things I want to end on here, what, well, how much time I got? If they're still active over there, I'm going to be active over here. They're still active over there. All right. Okay, so I want to emphasize this part because I will be dealing with my sermon on some of this this morning. And that is point B, marriage and the home began here, Genesis 3, 18 through 25. I would suggest on any faithful member of the church seeking to teach somebody the way of righteousness in order to work with them properly that you start in Genesis, not in Acts. That you start in Genesis, not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John but start in the beginning. Genesis. Because fundamental things are laid down about the nature of man and all sorts of other things. But one of those things is marriage in the home. I mentioned in the beginning of the class how what a messed up affair we're in today in this nation. Marriage in the home. If you want to have a man on the street situation, walk up to a person and say, tell me the meaning of marriage and see what you get. Ask them, especially younger people, before you can live with a woman or a man as husband and wife, must you be married? Is it essential? Is it necessary? See what you get. And so on down the line. Without a scriptural marriage, there cannot be a scriptural home. It just cannot be. When you look at Genesis, you have a scriptural marriage, one man for one woman until death through them part. And you have a home beginning. Now, how would you define a home as far as its relationship to society? Is it not the basic unit of society? 
the home. That's the reason when the home gets messed up in general throughout a society, what about the society? It's messed up. There's just no if, ands, or buts about it. Uh, if you have a some sort of uh, puzzle you're trying to put together and you've got one of the pieces of it messed up or several messed up, will you ever get the whole picture like it was meant to be? No, you won't. And in this area, we just haven't done a good job. And I say we over the whole nation, but especially I mentioned the church. That this is God's first ordained institution, the, the home. The church is God's family. Let me ask you this. What came after the establishment of marriage in the home as far as God institutions? The concept of government, civil government. Then what? The church. So there are three God-ordained institutions. When I say ordained, what do I mean? Official institutions. He started them. He regulates them. He controls them. So you have marriage in the home. And you have civil government, the concept of civil government. And you have then the church or the family of God. Neither one can usurp the authority of the other. Roman Catholicism, in all of its errors, says the church controls all of them. And if you want to see how that worked, just study the feudal ages in Europe, and you'll see that they didn't do anything except the Roman Catholic Church approved it. And if they did, there's big trouble. A good example of that is Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon, his first queen. Now, surely we've seen enough on television about that to know what got him in trouble with the Roman Catholic Church, that is, Henry VIII. He wanted to divorce Catherine of Aragon, according to their view of all that. The Pope said, nope, can't do it, which the Pope had no right to say one way or the other as far as his power is concerned, for he has no power. But that was the way it was then. They controlled all of that. In fact, they still have the papal documents and all of that, just like it appeared when they made Henry VIII, King of England, excommunicate. And that meant that all these other Catholic places, if you, if you can get somebody over there to kill him, that's fine. And that's one reason Spain was such a vehement enemy, because they were, they outpoped the Pope in Spain, is to show their loyalty. And thus, you had all sorts of wars between France, but especially in Spain, and so on. Well, anyway... The point is, God, through His Word, regulates the home. God will, concerning the purpose and design of civil government, is revealed, and that part does not get studied very much. And then when it comes to the church, it's basically where we study, where we do these things, according to the will of God. Both of y'all look like you want me to quit. It's time. Okay, so they're, they're turning loose over there, huh? Well, we thank you very much. Appreciate it. Any questions, right now, and we'll try to deal with them.